I'm going to warn you all before we even get started, there is a lot of techno babble in this one. I actually feel like I should probably upload the blooper reel for you all, because it's big. But enough of my self-indulgent waffling, you have been warned, let's get on with it. With the final season of Picard solidly underway, we have a new hero starship. We've broken it down before, but with some new information, some episodes already under its belt, and some... Well, let's call it conflicting information about its history. It's time to break it down again. <laughs> yes, that's right. We're talking once more about the USS Titan, the new flagship of the Star Trek Picard series. And I'm going to say this next part ultra slowly for the benefit of all the pedants in the comments section. I said flagship of the Picard series, not the actual Starfleet flagship. For now, we know that is the Odyssey class Enterprise F. I just had to get a mention of that ship in there. <laughs> now, it should be worth mentioning that we're making this video to update you on the new USS Titan A. As such, when Star Trek Picard Season 3 finishes airing, we'll take a more in-depth look at the Titan and how it performed in the third and final season of the show. Which means, yes, possibly a third breakdown video. You're welcome. Okay? Okay. Let's get into it. Welcome to Track Central, Lords, Ladies and Sovereigns. I am your host, Lieutenant Commander Adam, and it's time to beam on board for some Star Trek Picard goodness. No, I mean it. This is not a video about the Defiant. No. <laughs> Good God, when was the last time I even mentioned that ship? Don't answer that. Moving on. No, we're diving into Picard Season 3. And remember, if you want to keep up to date with all of our lovely videos, just hit that subscribe button to never miss one. Go on, do it. As always, please let us know your thoughts in the comments section below, because if you're talking about Star Trek, we want to hear about it. Okay, engage. The Constitution 3 class, or I suppose you could call it Neo-Constitution, was active during the turn of the 25th century. The USS Titan A in its ranks, coming into service in 2401. The previous USS Titan, commanded previously by William T. Riker, was retired in 2398 from active service due to damage. Captain Shaw would oversee what I'm going to call the construction of the USS Titan A, which would utilize many of the internal components of the original Lunar class vessel, whilst the exterior would change visibly in design. Something that has actually happened in Star Trek twice now. Anyway, moving on. The design of the Constitution 3 class, known in Starfleet as the Neo-Constitution, as I mentioned before, was a nostalgic look back to the original USS Titan, the NCC-1777, a Shangri-La class vessel commanded by Captain Savick, and which served as the Federation flagship for a short time before the USS Enterprise B was launched, and then immediately proceeded to get its face punched off by a giant burning space blanket. What, the Nexus looked like a blanket that somebody had left drying on the line in the middle of a windstorm, and then set on fire. Maybe we should just move on. The Titan A comes in with a new length of 560 and a half meters, which for the time would make it slightly smaller than the Inquiry class. The Neo-Constitution was an underdog in Starfleet, not as powerful as the Inquiry class, but providing a slightly different function. The saucer itself was extremely similar to that of the Shangri-La class. Interestingly enough, the saucer of the Luna class was the exact same length, but slightly more oval in shape, so the Luna class saucer could have been modified to make this new one without much effort. The bridge module was located in the middle of the top of the saucer, as tradition dictates in an extraordinarily vulnerable position, with a sensor array in the middle of the saucer on the underside. The vessel was designed to operate best at sublight speeds, and with that came its impressive impulse engines. These engines appeared on the rear of the saucer. There were two of them located within cutouts on the rear, and still an additional four impulse engines were also located in the middle of the structure, connecting the saucer to the neck. These impulse engines were split into groups of two on either side of what I can only refer to as a highly reinforced neck. Make of that what you will. This neck looks to have two sets of aft torpedo launchers to boot. The secondary hull reminds me, actually, quite a lot of the Excelsior class compared to the Constitution, if I'm honest. It's not as cylindrical as you would expect. It's still curved, but there's a rectangular element in there. 
The lower section near the aft of the secondary hull curves towards the center, giving a very Starfleet-looking silhouette. The Titan A's main deflector dish is sunk into the front of the secondary hull, possibly for more protection, but it is a standard circular-shaped deflector dish either way. The aft of the secondary hull houses the shuttle bay, with a constitution-looking hangar bay door with the words Titan emblazoned on the back. The Titan's nacelles are connected to the secondary hull by pylons, another standard Starfleet feature in most ships anyway, which curves slightly upwards. The nacelles themselves have orange bissard collectors, similar to many ships of the 25th century. The nacelle structure, however, is interesting, with a more rectangular look, the sloping front tapering off near the rear, and these nacelles also have glowing blue highlights near the bissard collectors, and then a strip near the rear of the nacelle, which pulses when active. I guess they just needed more blinkies, whatever. The ship's interior was very similar to other Starfleet ship interiors of the 25th century, with Sagan-class style corridors and bridge. The corridors are very clean and differ from the carpeted corridors we've seen on most Federation ships from the 24th century. As the corridors are the same as the Stargazer, some corridors will be equipped with weapon racks similar to what is seen on the Sovereign-class starships of the time. The turbo lifts are also very spacious, with terminal screens around the walls giving visual readouts of the ship, handlebars in case of emergencies, took them long enough, and even a retinal eye scanner. Okay then. The bridge is the same bridge module as the Sagan-class USS Stargazer, with it being very sleek and the usual iconic central command chair flanked by chairs on either side for other senior officers. A setup found on most Federation ships, but in this one demonstrating something slightly awkward. Those chairs are nominally supposed to be for the captain, the first officer, and then either the second officer or a mission specialist. I just kind of feel it was a missed opportunity for Riker and Picard to have come aboard, had this big argument about chairs, and then somebody just goes and gets a couple of random folding chairs from the captain's ready room and just plonks them next to those. You call it slapstick, I call it realism. The central captain's area is elevated with stairs leading to the front of the bridge, which honestly represent a tripping hazard in my mind, but shut up, Adam, no one cares about that. But at least there's ramps on either side. There are also two individual four control consoles for the helmsman and tactical officers. These front consoles also have holographic-assisted foot controls. Around the room are large wall-length consoles showing various displays for comms, operations officers, so on and so forth. There are also standing consoles, two at the front of the bridge and two at the rear with a transparent display above them. The ones at the rear are in front of the primary ODN manifolds, a system upgraded in the 25th century. These manifolds include the Daystrom M47 Quadratronic Processing Unit, which was obviously working much better than the M5 Multitronic Processing Unit seen in the original series episode, The Ultimate Computer. Titan systems would also include bioneural gel pack technology, with this tech also being incorporated into the more dynamic isolinear chips, allowing for more reliable storage, faster speed, and more intuitive processing. The bridge's view screen was created using holographic reconstruction generators, HRGs, that create a 3D view of space, data, or information and project it on the viewer. Funny enough, the Enterprise D had a similar capability with its main view screen, but because of cost restrictions and technological limitations, we never got to see that on screen. Just a little gem for you there from the Next Gen Tech Manual. I will never stop reading that book. Unlike the Enterprise D, however, the Titan had the ability to drop a blast shield over the opening, becoming a transparent window on demand, therefore making it a window, a view screen, and a giant slab of armor all at the same time. The interior layout of the Titan that we know of so far would be the main bridge, briefing room, viewing lounge and observation rooms on deck one, officer's mess on deck two, captain's quarters on deck three, and the officers' quarters on decks 4 through 8. Numerous holodecks would exist on decks 5 through 9, docking ports also on deck 9, cargo bays on decks 11 to 12A, which is weird, and the main engineering deck on E1. You know, it doesn't make any sense to me either. 
We know that some of the crew quarters included bunk beds for lower ranking officers on the ship, or guests you want to annoy. <laughs> and the captain's quarters located on deck three had large windows covering the wall to give the captain a good look at where his ship was, because we all suffer with that problem in the morning. Another room would be a dining room, available to the ship's senior staff with custom plates and cutlery for the occasion. Whether the ship had a galley for such occasions or if it was just replicated is not known. The Neo-Constitution class being a ship active in the 25th century would surely have access to all the latest and greatest in technology as well. Possibly having an operational quantum slipstream drive as well as fast warp travel for its propulsion systems. Photon torpedoes, phaser arrays, maybe even quantums in its armament system, and a shield system for its defensive complement. One would hope so. Though we don't know exactly what its armaments would be, we do know its defensive capabilities as the ship comes equipped with metaphasic shields. This type of shield system was first shown to be successful by Dr. Beverly Crusher during her time on the USS Enterprise D, and later by Geordi LaForge to protect the Enterprise from the force of a star's corona. The Titan had a complement of Type 14 shuttlecraft, the same shuttlecraft seen on the Sagan-class USS Stargazer. One of these shuttles was even named the Savick, honoring the original USS Titan's commander once again. The legacy of the USS Titan is a long one, and it starts with that original ship, the NC-1777. As we said before, this original ship was a Shangri-La class, commanded by Captain Savick, and even spent time as the fleet's flagship under commendation by Captain Sulu of the Excelsior. The vessel was launched in 2290, and it's known for its encounters with the Klingon Empire, the Exoport Takeover, and the Horizon Colony Rescue. The ship would also be instrumental in maintaining frontier stability before the Kittimer Accords were signed and the launch, of course, of the Enterprise B. The second vessel in the legacy was the famous Luna-class USS Titan, NCC-80102, captained by William T. Riker following his time on the Enterprise D and E. Riker would come to command the Titan after the Shinzon incident of 2379, and later would be seen dealing with the Pakled incident in the 2380s, serving with his wife, Commander Deanna Troy, and well-known Starfleet officer Bradward Boimler for a time. Captain Riker and Troy would have a child called Thaddeus Riker aboard the Titan. However, they would leave the USS Titan in 2391 and retire to the planet of Nepenthe after their son was diagnosed with mendaxic neurosclerosis. Going by the words of Captain Liam Shaw, he would presumably have taken command of the USS Titan in the year 2396. That means someone else would have either been captain of the Titan between 2391 and 2396, the ship would be heavily damaged in 2398, though, and undergo refit. Also in 2398, Lieutenant Matthew Arliss Moura would join the Titan as tactical officer. During the refit, the ship would be changed into the Constitution 3 class, Neo-Constitution, whatever you want to call it, with a new external body to honor Savick's Titan. Still, the same internal systems as the Luna class remained to honor Riker's Titan. The Titan itself would join a select few ships to be honored with a letter suffix, with this new Titan being the USS Titan NCC-80102A. Shaw would take the Titan on 36 missions in his five years of service, though presumably one of these missions is the one where the Titan would be damaged enough to require its refit. After Captain Riker's return to Starfleet in 2399, he would assist with the Titan's refit into the Titan A. Shaw, though being Jellicoe-like in the style of command, would keep the Titan in a three-shift rotation instead of a four-shift rotation. And we all know how big of a deal that was. After the Borg incident of 2401, Seven of Nine would join Starfleet under recommendation by both Admirals Janeway and Picard. Shaw would personally pick Seven to serve as his XO, but for what reason we don't really know. He would also make sure she went by her former human name, and he would be against her Borg nature almost entirely. The Titan would also have Ensign Sidney Crash LaForge oh. serving as a helmsman of the Titan, following the footsteps of her father, Geordi. Because lest we forget, in the early days of TNG, Geordi LaForge was the Enterprise D's helmsman, before he became the chief engineer of the Galaxy-class starship later on. The Titan would return to Earth's space dock, where it would pick up guests of Admiral Picard and Captain William T. Riker, 
who through the help of Commander Seven would get the Titan to the Riken system on the border of Federation space. The Titan A was designed by notable Trek Starship designer Bill Krauss, who was responsible in Season 2 of Picard for making the ship models of the USS Stargazer in the Stargazer's ready room. Bill has made many other Starship models, with his ships sharing a very motion picture vibe which this ship also has. The Titan A began as a photoshopped mock-up from a physical model of the Shangri-La Mark II ship by Bill Krauss and was built for Terry Matlas, showrunner of Star Trek Picard. One weekend, Terry simply asked, what would it look like with Picard-era nacelles? And boom, the Shangri-La Mark III, Constitution III, Neo-Constitution class was born. Pick a bloody name, guys. As mentioned, the ship uses the same interior as the USS Stargazer, mainly as a cost-effective way to reuse this great set made for Season 2. I mean, it only appeared in two episodes. You can't let that go to waste. It has already seen more use in Season 3 of Picard, though. Much of the work on the USS Stargazer bridge comes from concept artists like James Chung, Darko Darmar Markovic, graphic designers like Jeffrey Mandel, the great Dave Blass, production designer, and all the other people involved, such as the actual set builders themselves. The primary ODN manifold faster than light nanoprocessing unit from the bridge of the Titan A was designed by Darko Dharma Markovic. Concept artist James Chung created many concepts for the bridge and its consoles. He even designed the forward bridge consoles to have the holographics assisted foot controls on the console's floor, which honestly is probably the most hilarious addition to a bridge that I have ever seen. So far, there isn't much else we can say about the behind the scenes work on the Titan A but hopefully we'll get some more behind-the-scenes stuff later on in the season. But what do you think of the new Starship design? Do you like the incorporation of motion picture era ship aesthetics, or would you have preferred more time on the Stargazer? Because personally, the ship is definitely growing on me. I just wish they would pick a name for the damn class. Will you let us know in the comments below? Because as always, if you're talking track, we want to hear about it. And again, if you want to keep up to date on all the latest Star Trek news, lore, and more, then make sure you hit the subscribe button and never miss a video from the team here at Trek Central. You can also follow us on social media or join our community Discord server. But for now, I've been Lieutenant Commander Adam. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Live long and prosper, my friends.